We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Good morning, ACC. How are you guys? All right. Hey, my name is Pastor John um, and I get the honor of serving y'all as executive pastor of ministry. Uh, This morning, I got a great text. You ever get one of those early morning texts that you're like, I don't want to get that. What is that? And then there's other ones where you're like, that's great news. I got a great news one. Okay, so whether you're joining us in person, online, or over in the lounge, first and foremost, no, we're glad you're here, and I have a text for you from Pastor Matt. Here it is. Last night, our Ecuador team, our GO team is in Ecuador, uh, last night, our Ecuador team enjoyed a team debrief by a fire and then headed to bed by 10 p.m. We're waking up now and prepping for a long, it's capital letters, long day of church day one of VBS, and an excursion to the center of the world where we will be on the northern and southern hemispheres at the same time. That's right. You can be in two places at once, finally. We'll wrap up the day with dinner, debrief, and bed. We appreciate your prayers for energy, sun protection, and a successful VBS program as we meet many new Ecuadorian children and tell them about Jesus. So, yeah. So today we're going to take our own excursion into the book of Ephesians, and we're going to be finishing off our series as we go into Ephesians 6. But first, let's go to the Lord with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for how you love us, and we thank you for how you work in and through us as the body of Christ. Father, we pray for this Ecuadorian uh, GO team, asking, Father, that you would minister to them and through them. Father, that you would help them to connect with you and connect with the Ecuadorian church to bring about miracles, to bring about moments where heaven touches earth. Father, we ask, Lord, that, that you would do a mighty work. Father, we ask that you would bring about divine appointments. And Father, we ask both for them as well as for us today, Father, that you would do exceedingly more than we could ever ask or imagine in accordance with your holy word. We ask this in Jesus Christ's name. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. amen. Well, you know, um, a couple weeks ago, I had an opportunity to share a word and we were going through Ephesians 4. And as we were going through that, I shared about the fact that as we come to this place called Ephesus, a a letter uh, that Paul, who is in bondage, he's in chains, he's, he's in jail, he's writing to this church in Ephesus. And that church, it was in Gentile territory, there were these mysteries, and today we're going to be talking about the mystery, uh, mystery of faithfulness. But there were mystery religions, and those mystery religions, they would hear the mysteries, they would hear the secrets, and they would keep them to themselves. But when God talks about mysteries... He's talking about like revelation. He's he's revealing things. And as he's revealing it, it's not something that we keep to ourselves. It's something that we share with everyone around us. But there's another aspect to this. In antiquity, in Ephesus, this would have been a place with both mystery religions, but there was this this, uh, uh, it was like people were trying to do magic or incantations. Whatever they were trying to do, they were trying to kind of get a little bit of power. They were trying to find out what's going to happen in the future. Now, I'm certain nobody here has ever attempted anything like that. Um, But at the same time, I'm just curious. Growing up over the years, maybe you have. Maybe when you were looking at the comics growing up, did you ever meander into the horoscopes? Or maybe, because you know they're all true, right? Or maybe you went out for Chinese and, you know, the best thing at the restaurant, it's the fortune cookie at the end, isn't it? 
and you crack that thing open and, and, and you read this saying, you will inherit nothing today. No, it's something good always, right? It's always good. You know, it never, it never proclaims something bad. And, and, and so you know that those numbers on the, on the back of the fortune cookie, those are your lotto numbers. You are going to win. You are going to win. Now, there are th- times that we try to get control as well. Even today, we, we want to have that control somehow or another. And that is the stage from which Ephesians is being written. If you've got a Bible, go ahead and open up to Ephesians chapter 6. And if you don't have a Bible, um, you can actually, there's a Bible right in front of you, underneath the chair in front of you. And here's the thing, that Bible, that's our gift to you. Go ahead, that's yours. Um, And if you're in the front row, just turn around and say, can I have your Bible? Okay. And, And I'm certain that people will be very generous towards you. Okay. But as we go into Ephesians 6, what we find is that Paul has been talking all along the way. And he finally gets to Ephesians 6.10. And he says, a final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. Now, this morning, as we're looking at this, we're going to look at five particular strategies to stand faithfully. And as we read this first one, what we see is the importance to acknowledge the enemy, but fix your eyes on Jesus. Acknowledge the enemy, but fix your eyes on Jesus. Maybe you've never heard, but we have an enemy, okay? He goes by the name Satan, the devil, Lucifer. Okay, and he parades himself as an angel of light according to the scriptures. He doesn't show up in a, in a red suit. He doesn't have pointy horns or pitchfork or anything like that. He's not in charge of hell. He's actually, that's his destination. God is going to be sending him there forever and for always. Hell was literally created for the devil and his angels. So understanding he is a threat. Hear what Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 8. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to have lunch with, to have, to, to, to have coffee, to have fun. No, to devour. He, want, he's not, he wants to have you for his lunch, okay? He wants to have you for his lunch, Now, when I talk about acknowledging the enemy, but fixing your eyes on Jesus, I love what C.S. Lewis says. This is a a Christian writer. Um, He was originally atheist, and eventually he just saw so much information. He he could not deny the fact that Jesus is real, that he is God incarnate, that he died for our sins. And he says this, you can give the devil too much or too little attention. What he's saying is, you can either see the devil under every single rock, or you can act as if he doesn't exist at all. And unfortunately, far too many believers, they don't acknowledge that there's an enemy at all. They just think, you know, I've got things going on in here, you know, there's things going on in my family, there's things going on in the world. And we're just seeing with our human eyes. We're not seeing with our spiritual eyes. And we'll get into that a little bit more. But as we go on in Ephesians, fixing our eyes on Jesus, Paul tells us in verse 12, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. See, The enemy is not the person that's in front of you. The enemy is not another country, another nation. There are, there is someone behind all of these things. The enemy, Satan, as it were, would use the inward, our flesh against us, but he would also use the outward, that is the world against us, causing us to want to make a name for ourselves, perhaps seeking fortune, fame, Something that we are reliant on ourselves and no one else. And this leads to the second strategy to stand faithfully. Life in Christ is a battleground. 
not a playground. Life in Christ is a battleground, not a playground. Now, as I say this, oftentimes, you know, maybe you just started walking with Jesus or you're exploring the faith and that's fantastic. We're glad you're here. This is a safe place to ask questions. But maybe you've been walking with Jesus for some time and as you've been walking with him, you know, you're like, yeah, I know Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. This is great. Yeah, God's got a purpose and a plan. And those things are all true. But you have to also know that it's not just a playground. It's a battleground. There is a battle going on for your soul if you don't know Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, God is trying to draw you to him. And Satan is trying to get you distracted here or there. But guess what? When you become a believer in Christ, when you begin walking with Christ, Satan will continue to try to distract you because he does not want you to know the truth. He wants you to... We're going to talk about the armor of God here in a moment, but here's the thing. He wants you... He knows that he can't get you to not have any armor on, but he wants you to not even know that there's armor. We'll get to that in a moment. It goes on in verse 13. Paul says, Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will be standing firmly. So we got to put on the full armor of God. The third, the third strategy to stand faithfully, believers don't fight for victory. We fight from a place of victory. Newsflash. Oftentimes, you know, we're in the middle of life and we're doing life and we feel like we're in the middle of a battle. You've even come to a place of acknowledging, I'm in the middle of a battle. I know that I'm in the middle of a battle. But I'm responsible for the outcome. I have it in my own strength. I know that these things are going on and, and I don't know if I can win it. I don't know if I can win it. I want you to know the battle. The victory's already been won. We are fighting. If, if, you, if you are walking with Jesus, you stand in a place of victory. You fight from a place of victory. It's kind of like World War II. You know, you have all the people uh, who have been fighting against each other. I just watched this in a, in a movie the other night. And I was watching as, you know, all these people are coming together. They're signing the piece of paper that says... The war is finished. We're not going against war in, with each other any longer. But there were still battles that continued to be fought for some time because the news had not gotten elsewhere around the world. There was a fight being fought, but the outcome had already been determined. The outcome has already been determined on the cross. On the cross, when Jesus died for our sins, he conquered sin, he conquered death, he conquered Satan. And now all Satan can do is try to get us distracted, try to tempt us, try to do these things. And we'll talk about some of those strategies that he uses. But I, I, I think of 2 Kings chapter 6. I think of a story here when Elisha, the prophet Elijah, is on top of a mountain. And as he's on the mountain, he's with his serpent, servant, and the servant is looking all around the mountain. And all he sees are chariots and enemies and all these people. And he's kind of freaking out. He's kind of freaking out like, oh my goodness, we're surrounded. What are we going to do? And I love what Elijah says. He says, don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. I'm certain that he was looking at him going, have you looked around at all? And Elijah prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. See, they were, always, they were already there. Everything that was going on in the heavenlies, it was all happening around them. but he couldn't see it. How often do you struggle in your marriage? How often do you struggle in your family? How often do you struggle with self-esteem? How often do you struggle and forget that there's something going on 
And if, if we could just see for a moment, God would open our eyes. Maybe this morning, the prayer that you need to pray is simply this. God, open my eyes. Help me to see what only you can see, Lord. Help me to see the depths of my heart the way that you see them. Help me to see that you are working in me and through me. Help me to see. Paul goes on in verse 14, and he continues on and says, Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes put on peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. Hear very clearly. There is truth. There's not your truth and my truth. There's a truth, and it is found in him. It is found in God's word. And he says, put on that truth. Because so often we will be bombarded with lies throughout life. And when we stand in the truth of God's word, when we stand in the truth of the gospel, we will not, we will not fall to the lies of the enemy. In addition to that, putting on the armor of God's righteousness. Understand, we don't have a righteousness in and of ourselves. It's his righteousness bought for us on the cross. In addition to that, having, having the gospel of peace, walking in it everywhere, whenever somebody asks you, why do you have hope? Having the ability to share with them why you have that hope. What is the hope that you have within you? And doing it, as Peter says, with gentleness, with gentleness and kindness. The fourth strategy of stand, to stand faithfully, we see faith without faithfulness is no faith at all. Now, I remember writing that and going, wait a minute, that faith, what? But I looked at it and I went, no, that's, that's, that, that's exactly it. Faith without faithfulness is no faith at all because standing faithfully requires action, not words alone. You ever heard the saying, when the words and the actions don't match up, always trust the actions. Always trust the actions. James, brother of Jesus, he says this in James 2.26, just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. Or as one of my mentors has put it, what you believe determines what you think, and what you think determines what you do. Let me say that again. What you believe determines what you think, and what you think determines what you do. Therefore, if you want to know what a person really believes, pay attention to their actions. Faith without faithfulness is no faith at all. And God wants each and every single one of us to have faith in Him and in His abilities. And, and Paul goes on in verse 16 and he says, in addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Now, I've asked uh, my friend Mac, Mac, where are you? If Mac can come up here, I'm not seeing Mac. So here's the deal. In the midst of this, I need an actual volunteer, okay? Do we have any volunteers? Gary, yeah, perfect. Come on up. That's perfect. Come on, come on, come on. All right, Gary, you're going to help me out here for a moment, all right? That's right, that's right. She has the life insurance, okay? Now... This is going to get really interesting right about now. So, all right, this is your shield, Gary. You want to hold on to that, okay? Okay. All right, now hold both of them because, you know. Now, in antiquity, a Roman shield would have been roughly about four feet tall by two feet wide. Now, we have these two pieces here, and this is basically your shield, okay? So, so you want a shield. Hold this very clearly. In fact, actually, I need something for um, myself um, you know, right here, we're just going to put that little target right there, okay? Now, within this, understand the verse, what, is, what does the verse say? Can you guys read that to me? All right, let's say this with conviction. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil, right? So, 
I really think that it's important that we have visuals and that we can recognize exactly what's going on. So don't worry, I've, I, I know what I'm doing, Gary. I've done this before. Um, I've got a target too, so I know where I'm going, okay? Seriously, you guys would let me do that? Are you insane? Gary, I don't know. She does have the life insurance. You might want to watch out. All right, <laughs> Gary, come on over here with those. Here, I'll help you out. So here's the deal. <laughs> I wasn't going to shoot you this time. <laughs> All right, so here's the deal. We have fiery arrows. Why are they fiery, fiery arrows? Oftentimes when you're reading this, you might be thinking of, oh, there's like one arrow. No! There is a cascade of fiery arrows all coming down. Now, imagine that we're, we're going to battle. Now, if you were by yourself, and let's just say that that's yours. I'm going to give you a full thing right there, okay? Now, the fiery ar arrows, you've seen these movies. The cascade, it's all coming down. It's coming down at you. What are you going to be like? Are you just going to stand there? Yeah, now, here's the question. Do you think he's going to get hit? Yeah. Because there's more than one arrow, but this is why it's important that there's more than just one shield. Because let's say that this is your shield and this is my shield. The first thing that we have to acknowledge is this. You know, Satan, he's got a target. It's not your shield. It's you and me. And this is one of the reasons that while I have a shield and, and Gary has a shield, and if you were a follower of Jesus, you have a shield, you have to take up the shield of faith. And you have to link it with others. In antiquity, the Romans, they would each have a shield and they would put them together. They would hunch down and then the others would put it over the top so that when that cascade of fiery arrows came down, not only were you protected, but the person to your sides and behind you are protected as well. See, it's not just about you as an individual. It's about linking arms with the person to your right and to your left. And you may be looking around and going, I don't know these people. That's what life groups are for, to get to know each other. And not only that, but that's what lunches are for, okay? That's, that's getting to know each other as the body of Christ. Gary, you did a fantastic job. Can we just give him a... Oh, you can just put it over there. I'll leave this one. So we're going to leave this here as a reminder for now, all right? I think that it's important that as we talk about this, that I also let you know very briefly what some of the strategies of the enemy are. Because you may have a shield, but if you don't know what to look out for, you don't know what darts, what arrows are coming at you. And they are real. And listen, this one, it's not fiery or anything. I, nobody was going to get hurt, okay? I know, I, I know myself. I got to be careful. That's why I didn't point. But within it, Within it, these are fiery darts, and it's not one, it's a cascade. And so here's your cascade. Here are five strategies that the enemy, Satan, would use. Lies, twisting words. We see that in Genesis 3. Temptation, we see that used against Jesus in Matthew 4. Downgrading sin, it's, it's not as bad as they say. Or how about this one? God will forgive you. God will forgive you. Using God against himself, as it were, using God's words against you. How about this? Confusion, discouragement. I call them the what ifs. See, all he can do is bring up the past. All he can do is bring up that past and say, well, you're like that, therefore your future is like this. Or you're not good enough in the present. He doesn't know what's going to come next. He doesn't know the future. So all he can do is dig up the past. If you have Christ, though, as your Lord and Savior, you know your past. And that's why the grace of God is so amazing. That God loves us so much to send his own son to die in our place so that we can have life, not just eternal life in the future, but life eternal now as the Holy Spirit takes up residence in believers. The fifth way that, fifth strategy of the enemy is this, disunity. He seeks to sow disunity in your marriage, in your family, in the church. He's constantly trying to do this. 
trying to get us off track to what God would have for us. And I would even lay out a sixth one, and that is fear. He is constantly using fear. That's that what if again. Paul goes on in verse 17, and he says, Put on salvation as your helmet. When we receive Christ, we receive salvation. We receive freedom. We put that on and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This is the one weapon that we're given, God's Word. If you can wield it well, it will protect you. We see this in Matthew 4 when Jesus is in the wilderness and Satan takes up words of the Scriptures. He twists them the way that Satan always does. He twists them. He proof texts them. That is, he says one verse, but he doesn't say the next verse after it, which actually talks against Satan himself. Jesus doesn't say, whoa, 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 that's not what the word says. That's not what it says. No, instead, he takes up God's word and says things like, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that protrudes out of the mouth of God. It's by God's word. In the scriptures, we, we hear this. This is one of the reasons that I think that it's so important to memorize Scripture so that we can defend ourselves, we can defend our family, we can defend our marriage, we can defend brothers and sisters in Christ. Brothers and sisters in crisis. I love what it says in Psalm 119.11. And if you know it, go ahead and recite it with me. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Yeah. How can I know what sin is if I don't know God's word? How can I know how to live for God if I don't know his word? How can I encourage one another? How can I, when I see something in, a, in, in somebody that I love, I'm not, maybe it's a brother in Christ and you're like, That's, I'm not quite certain about that. I know, I, I'm not quite certain what to say. I know that there's something wrong with that, but, well, guess what? There's a difference between opinions and God's words. We all have opinions, but this is the only opinion that actually matters. This is the only opinion that stands for all eternity. And Paul goes on, and, and he says in the next few verses, he really, he really, this is where the rubber meets the road because he's giving power. He's saying this is where the power really is as you are fully armored. He says in verse 18, pray in the spirit at all times, not when it's convenient, not just when good times, not just bad times, all the time, at all times and on every occasion, stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere and pray for me too. Ask God to give me the right words so I can boldly explain God's mysterious plan that the good news is for Jews and Gentiles alike. I am in chains now, still preaching this message as God's ambassador, which we are called to be as well. So pray that I will keep on speaking boldly for him as I should. And this, this leads into our last uh, strategy to stand faithfully, and that is prayer connects you with the power of God. Prayer connects you with the power of God. Now, as I was putting this together, I thought about one statement that I hear so often. I, 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 every once in a while, I hear this, and, and when I hear this from people, godly brothers and sisters in Christ, I hear it, and I just I kind of wince a little because I feel like this is exactly what the enemy would want us to believe. It's exactly what the enemy would want us to hear. And it's this, the enemy would have you believe that prayer changes you alone. Prayer changes you alone. It doesn't change the situation. It doesn't change anything that's going on. No, 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 no. Yes, it does change us, but it does more than that. It invites God into a situation. It, in, it invites the power of God into a situation. If I pray for somebody for healing, guess what? That doesn't just change me. In fact, I'm hoping and I'm praying that God will heal that person. If I'm praying for the healing of your marriage, that's not just for me, that's for your marriage. If I'm praying that, you know what? I've got a prodigal over here. 
And this prodigal, I've been praying for them night and day, and my heart has been broken over it. Guess what? God might work in my heart, but I'm praying that God will work in their heart. And so when we look at this scripture, be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. Why would we pray for believers everywhere? Why would we pray for Paul? Why would we pray for the Go Adventure team in Ecuador or the Ecuadorian church or the Ecuadorians or our neighbors if it just changes us and us alone? Because it connects you with the power of God. I don't know what you've been praying for, but I'm certain that there is something that you've been praying for for a very long time. Maybe it wasn't a prayer specific. Maybe it was, I don't know what to do, God. Or maybe you haven't even known to call upon God. You've just been like, I don't know what to do. I love what Erwin McManus said preacher says in his book, The Way of the Warrior. This is the paradox that the warrior has to come to know. They know they are not the source of their own strength. The fire that burns within the warrior is an eternal fire. The warrior knows their strength because they know their weakness. Don't we all? We know. We all have clay feet, don't we? It was Jesus who said, Apart from the Father, I can do nothing. The warrior understands there is no weakness in this. The warrior has found their strength in their weakness. The way of the warrior is to know that God is our strength. So as we come to this what now God moment, as we reflect, that thing a moment ago that was on your heart that you're like, I... I I need prayer for this. I need prayer for that. I've been talking about this. I've been, I've been doing these things for quite some time. I want to encourage you. On the back of the front of the seat, there is a connect card. It's just a small card. I want to encourage you. Whatever that thing that's been on your heart, on your mind, that you've been praying about, that you've been thinking about, that it's been waking you up at night, that you've been struggling with, I want to encourage you. Write it on that. At the end of the service, just bring it, put it right up here. Our staff, we're going to pray for you. Our prayer team, we're going to pray for you. And if you're like, hey, I need this to be confidential, write confidential on it. Or don't even put your name. God knows who you are. God knows what you're looking for and what your need is. But as we come to the end of this message, I want you to know, again, the enemy only knows your past and present. Make them fear what God does next. Make them fear what God does next. Some of you need to know you can stop fighting for victory. And you can begin fighting from victory. You've never received Christ as your Lord and Savior. You've never said, I can't, I've come to the end of myself, I can't do this anymore. God, I believe that your son Jesus died for me and rose from the dead, and I am accepting him as my personal Lord and Savior. I know that you died for me. I know that I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I want to walk with you. I want the Holy Spirit to take up residence in my heart and in my life. And if that's you this morning, just pray with me in a moment. Just pray with me in a moment. And here's the thing. It's really simple begin walking with him. And, and, and the first way that he asks us to walk with him, we go into that baptismal. You know why? We're being buried into Christ. We're taking all that sin and everything and we're burying it. We're going to bury the past, the present, and the future. And we get to rise to fullness of life in him. But for many of us, you know, maybe, maybe you're like me. This kind of hit me. This hit me hard as I was putting together this message. Some of us need to begin to stand in the Lord like not only does our life, not only does our life depend on it, your life depend on it, but the people around us, we need to begin doing battle for those to our right and to our left in the body of Christ. We need to begin doing battle in prayer 
in God's word, speaking the truth in love. Every one of us have a target. And here's the thing. You are the target. But you are also the target of God's love. And you don't go to battle on your own. Jesus has already won the battle. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask, Father, there are those sitting here today who they don't even know you, but they want the victory in Christ. So we're just going to pray together really quick. We're going to call upon you, God, in power and in love. God, please forgive us of our sins. We know that we're sinners. Please forgive us of our sins. We're placing our hope and our faith, our past, our present, and our future. In your son, Jesus Christ, we believe that you died for our sins, Jesus, and that you rose from the dead. We now accept your son, Jesus, as our Lord and Savior. Father, please help us to take the steps to go to battle for one another and to walk in a place of victory, to stand in a place of victory, to stand our ground to take up the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit, to put on the full armor of God. We ask this in Jesus Christ's name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, You can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.